right now, Douglas Copeland joins me in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Gian, hello. How nice are you? to have. Nice to see you again. Oh, well, thank you. And um, congratulations on this new book. Oh, thank you. What's it like doing interviews and having to talk about wor- the worst person ever continuously? Well, I think everyone expects it to be me. <laughs> and they can't wait me to do, for do something very horrible and like, just swear like a pirate. And it's not really something I, I mean, I do swear. I mean, I think I swear more than most people, but I don't swear the way Raymond does. He's English. And to really swear properly, you need to be English. They just, there's something about the way they, the contempt for the universe in a way. And I, I, can you swear on the show? Sure. If you need to. Like, sir, like, blue, this, like, blue, like, fricking and sugar and through the. <laughs> You're really Canadian <laughs> like, at this point. Like, you asked if you could swear <laughs> and then you, and then you intentionally <laughs> didn't swear. <laughs> well, I, the whole thing about like. First there was the request. Okay, the the that, formal request, can I swear? Well, the, there's that word fricking. Um, like friggin'? Like I'm so friggin' mad or I'm so yeah. freaking mad. Like everyone knows you swear, but you didn't swear. And <laughs> think about that. And like, oh, sugar, I'm so frigging mad. <laughs> and I, I think if you, there's, there's a certain amount of, like it has to be bad stress for your body if you're sort of self-censoring at that level of dialogue. Right. Like, like there's like one millionth of a second before you can say the other thing, but no, you would have frigging instead. I think that's how you end up with like shingles. You're making or, the case that swearing is physically good for us. Well, it's practically a vitamin. <laughs> it's good for you. It is. It gets things. And yet you have out trouble you. saying it. Uh, what, 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 what it is you want to say? The, I mean, this book is written in the first person. Yes. So, uh, did you worry at all that people will think this is that you are Raymond? Well, in a weird way, it's like okay, Agatha Christie's dead. She has to be right. So, like, what if you went to Agatha Christie's former house with a shovel and a backhoe, and it turned out she had, like, 27 dead bodies in the backyard? Well, she doesn't, and so she's not a murderer, nor am I Raymond. Uh, I mean, I, do, I go through the world, world like anyone else, and I just listen to what people say, and, and God knows the Internet, you know. It's like the antivitamin. It just does these bad things for your system, and you see things you shouldn't see, but it all sticks. How much time do you spend on the Internet? Oh, that's a good question. I would say, okay, waking up in the morning, like I go to my news sites and which are... How how quickly after uh, you wake up? Coffee, you, you, I feed, feed the animals. Oh, I see. Then, you do some, you don't lean yeah. over, you know, you don't yawn, lean over and turn on the internet. Oh God, that's sort of like... Next to your bed. That would be... Not a, that I know anyone who does that. That would be a, a new, <laughs> a new bottoming out point if that were to happen. <laughs> uh, and I'd say I spent an hour and... There's this fact, and it's true, that the average human attention span is about the length of two and a half minutes, or like the length of a Beatles song. And I notice that myself when I'm working on whatever, and maybe you do too. It's like, dum, dum, dum. And there's that, like back when I smoked, it was like, I need a cigarette. And now it's like, oh, I need to uh, look at cute puppies, or oh, I need to check my email, or whatever. That There's this natural point our brain just gets every... 150 seconds. And the internet certainly facilitates that. Oh, it's wonderful for it. What did we do before it? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have this slogan, I miss my pre-internet brain, but not really. <laughs> it was boring back then. We didn't have like new stuff coming all the time. And But if your point is that you, so you look around and you're inspired or you get ideas and, and that's somewhere, somehow uh, where Raymond Gunt emerged. Uh, he, uh, we live in an age when the the anti-hero is the new hero. So so most of us are used to dark and nasty protagonists who have twi- a twisted code of ethics. But but with Worst Person Ever, you, you do kind of push the outer limit. You take us on this comic adventure with a genuinely despicable protagonist. How would you describe Raymond Gunt? Well, like you or me, he's delusional. And he... In his head, he thinks he's Jason Bourne, and you know, and when in fact he's sort of like a sort of malignant Mr. Bean sort of character, and he he always takes the low road. He always makes the wrong decision, and throughout the adventure, he has his sidekick Neil, who always sort of ends up like the more Raymond circles the drain, the more Neil sort of reaches the stars, and. Uh, he's just, you, you used the word potty mouth, I think, somewhere. Um, he's just like this, the, your inner child, your inner very badly behaved child. And 
Well, actually, okay. This is book 15, uh, 14, 15. Yeah, your 15th 15. novel. Okay, everyone's like, Doug, why are there no sex scenes in your book? I've been getting that for 14 books now. And you know, I look at all the books I like, you know, like Slaughterhouse Five or, you know, Evil and Wah, and like, there's no sex scenes in them. And like, since when did a sex scene become mandatory for, <laughs> for a novel? So I thought, okay, well, you want your sex scene? Now you get them. <laughs> But having said that, there's always a spoiler, or, or, or rather, there's always something that wrecks it every single time with poor Raymond, and then yeah, there's and, there's a, a series of karmic lessons. I mean, he doesn't get away with. He certainly is arguably the worst person ever in a lot of situations, but uh, it's not like he gains much by being the worst person ever. But he doesn't seem to learn the lesson, does he? <laughs> I, I don't know. Does anyone ever learn any lesson? Um, no, he just makes him. You know, he when does anyone ever learn any lesson? W- w- really, w- when something he does backfires, it's like, well, you know, I believe in karma and sugar and lightness and all that, but you know, so when something goes wrong, it's not my fault. It's the universe's mm-hmm. freaking fault that you know something went wrong. Um, you know, he, he starts talking about like maybe I could be, th- maybe I could be philanthropical. I could help like um, people with diseases or something, and then. You know, a minute later, it's like, well, it's not my fault they got some stupid disease. And so he always sort of subverts everything. Yeah, he can never yeah. last long. He's like the internet or, or like our attention spans. He can't last, <laughs> can't last being a good guy. Um, two steps back, you, you started your description of him by saying, like you and I, he's delusional. Are you and I delusional? Mm. I realize, okay, I don't know, uh, Well, you included me. Go ahead. Well... <laughs> Is a discussion I had last night at dinner. Like, do you ever, does anyone really know the effect they have on people? Uh, is it possible to be really super, super objective about yourself? I mean, and I think of like maybe someone like Tom Cruise. Like, does he take out his movies and get, does he go through all the dailies and like, oh, I, I moved my elbow the wrong way there? Or like, oh, like, well, I can do more of that. Um, and I used to think, you know, like, you know, I, I'm really, I, I, know, I know exactly how people perceive me. I have no idea. <laughs> You know, and, and we've all walked past a shop window and the lighting's just right and you catch a glimpse of yourself and like, oh my God, who's that tawdry rundown? Oh my God, it's me. And oh, good Lord, what happened? So and, we're delusional and that's not what I look we, in my we mind. Think we're better looking than we really we're are. Better looking, we probably, you know, send better thank you notes faster in our, in our dreams. Or I, <laughs> I just don't, is there anyone else? Is, is it there, always that, in that direction? Are we... <laughs> <laughs> are we always worse than uh, we think we are, or can uh, we be delusional in a you know, more helpful manner? You know, Gian, the, the elevator only goes down. <laughs> Welcome Thank to you. Earth. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. This is quickly turning into a dystopian interview. Um, well, I mean, each of us do have our own unique set of shortcomings, as you um, both uh, uh, sub- subliminally and overtly pointing out. But, but rather than try to hide his, Raymond, your protagonist, wears his most dislikable qualities like badges. He's, he's a totally unapologetic monster. While you were writing this novel, Doug, yeah. what, what kind of relationship did you have with him, your misanthropic creation, your Frankenstein, if you will? Oh, um, my Borat, sort of. Uh, it, when you write a book, when not just me, anyone, if you write fiction, you have to love your characters. I mean, it, 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 it's like your family, it, but you don't have to like them, but you have to love them. And then, and that's like so many relationships that we're handed to in life. You know, I, we've all got relatives that, you know, are trying, yet still love them. Um, uh, but the thing with Raymond is like, the other thing with characters too is, but if it's working very quickly in the book, in this case, it was about a third of the way through, the characters start writing the book for you. I mean, you know where they have to go in the end, but they just take over and, and you know, they say something absolutely appalling or do, like, oh my, I can't believe they did that. And then of course they, like, oh, wait, technically I did that, didn't I? Like, dang, I'm good, but no, I'm horrible. But like, where's this coming from? And where, you know, when anyone writes a character who's just appalling. Right. You know. Did you ever judge yourself while you were writing this guy? I mean, he says and does some horrible things. Well, someone along the way recommended, well, maybe, maybe he has Tourette's, maybe he can't help it. And I thought, well, that's kind of cheating actually, isn't yeah. it? You know, yeah, he's got a condition. Oh, it's like, he, oh, like, oh, he needs our pity and our love. Well, he, he, you know, he needs our laughter is what he needs. Um, 
so I guess there's all this stuff inside anyone that, given the right situation, it can all sort of percolate forth. But it also means that there's also an infinite number of characters in, you know, myself as a writer or you as a creative person, that there are all these entities inside of us just waiting for some form of expression, which almost is like a case for reincarnation, actually. But they, yeah. but this, you said that this is the first book you told me that you feel trepidatious about showing your parents that you in <gasps> fact you don't want your parents to read oh god yeah so douglas copeland uh, after all of the books that you've written i mean were you suppressing something the rest of the time or have you turned a corner and become <laughs> i wonder if i i think i may have turned some kind of corner yeah uh a good corner maybe into the wrong neighborhood um you know but i, I another part of this John, is that the last five years have just, for so many people, been just so lousy and dreary. And I, and I think that, what was the crash, 08, fall of 08? Mm -hmm. And so now it's like five years later. Um, the literature, the books people were writing tended to reflect this. And, and sort of earnest, plodding novels uh, filled with worthiness and... And I, I went to the bookstore and like there's this whole aisle that seems to have been stripped out of the bookstore called like, like, hey, have a laugh or something. And so this one here, I just, you know, I want to shock people out of them, their selves. I want to, you know, take them out of 2013 for a little bit. And, and then when they come back down to earth, like, oh, okay. But in, in, in many ways, partly because of the references in the book, uh, this feels like 2013. I mean, you, uh, Raymond Guntz, you've always been insightful and, and if not prescient about uh, our current culture and sort of deconstructing and dissecting it. Is Raymond Guntz a, a man of our times? I sort of, he's like, no, he's the... Um, He's the, actually the exact opposite of who you're supposed to be right now. Um, and that... I, I, I think this actually might be a book where it's its own category. Because I, I, I don't think there's any other book out there like it before, up until now. And what it is, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I've done that thing which I do, which is I forgot the original question. It was just about wh whether the worst person ever is f finds a particular resonance now, whether the Raymond Gunt is a, is a man of our times. Well, um, okay. Oh, oh just, uh, we're, we're live. We, we're not taping. Don't worry about that. The ums and say, stuff, are we? Say, take your time. Uh Sometimes I just like, you know what, 2013 is kind of boring. Let's just fast forward a bit to 2016. And I, uh, and there may be a bit of that involved in it. It's just, I think we're so used now to like having our own way with our content and what we see and what we can have is that we're actually maybe look around at the real world and go, oh man, let's just move this on a little bit, like mm -hmm. a PVR, or a, you know. What do they call PVR in the States? Uh, TiVo. TiVo, yeah. Um, yeah, no, we're in this weird time. Here's going 2001, September 11. Um, I mean, we, I also do visual work, and a lot of it, yeah, is, it was just sort of the opposite of this book, actually. It's quite serious and, and, and earnest and everything I say this book isn't. Um, I was with William Gibson down at the Key West Literary Festival a year ago, January. And we were talking about 9-11 and there was something about all those images of people down in like Wall Street looking up the buildings that was, uh, there was something I couldn't put my finger on. Then I realized it is like no one was actually holding up an iPhone or an Android or whatever and taking photographs and movies of what was happening because smartphones with cameras didn't really start until 2002. Right. And that, okay, if 9-11 were to happen today, there would have been millions, if not billions of mini movies, like from every conceivable angle, from every point of view. And that, you know, you go back to 9-11, it was possibly the, the, the last underreported mega event in human history. And so there's this sort of this, uh, uh, complete saturation of 
recording of we all know that in our lives these days of negativity of di- of, di- of, of just of, everything of disaster it's, no just every chronically lunch i mean you know but how does that tie in with the worst uh, well um uh and then the other thing too is that the people in the street in 2001 look exactly like people in the street in 2013 and i realized that as a culture we sort of we really start we no longer create time cues for ourselves. Like if you went to a 2013 theme party 20 years down the road, you know, what would you wear? Like exactly, probably what you'd have worn to a 2003, you know, theme party or whatever. So everything exists all at once now. Instead of having a unique time, we just have this time where everything overlaps. We've got steampunk mixing with shabby chic, mixing with uh, uh, 50s, you know, sci-fi movies, Betty Page, uh, and so it's all time and no time. But if 2013 is boring, not uh, boring. Well, it, you just called it boring a moment well, ago. Well, it could use a bit of. You said let's fast forward to 2016. It it, it needs like you only know, take a picture that's only so so good, but then you put an Instagram thing on it, and suddenly it looks like a cool picture. It needs. I just want to put a big Instagram needs to be filter Instagrammed. on everything. But yeah. but here's my question. I mean, because I was going to ask you if 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 we are collectively the worst society ever now, and then I was thinking, isn't that the way we always think? I mean, you know the expression "back in the day." I love that expression because when was back in the day? It seems to have been five years ago or some people refer to it meaning hip hop in the 80s or some people refer to it as the 60s. There's always a different back in the day. But back in the day is always better. It doesn't mean it, no one uses back in the day as uh, we were, you know, racist and 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 homophobic back in the day. It's always it always comes with something positive, and that's because we tend to think we t- tend to romanticize and see the past in rose colored glasses, right? So, mm. is is if we believe this is the worst society ever, can we even believe ourselves? Well, I don't believe we're the worst society ever, uh, and I I'm actually one of those few people I look back at the past and go either yuck or man i'm glad i'm not there anymore and and the few times i do get nostalgic and get out sort of the old letters i've written people and uh my parents especially if they saved and going through my old art school stuff it's like all i can see is self-delusion um wishful thinking cluelessness um, None of which has changed, apparently. Well, because <laughs> I've conquered all those issues, issues, Jan. I, I'm now essentially perfect. And <laughs> Except like, you're also still delusional, I'm glad I have a public forum to announce this revelation in. Uh, I, I, the, the past is fine, but I, I've always been... I've always liked the pre- all the books I've written always take place in the absolute... You know the months that they're they're taking place in, and it doesn't make them dated. It makes them little crystals, little time capsules, and I, I like that. And you look at a book like Microsurfs, which was written ninety three, ninety four, came out in ninety five, and it's like all about CD ROMs and you know mm-hmm. trying to download an image from AOL dot com or something. <laughs> and I, mean, I love I love being able to look back at that and enjoy it, but I don't really miss 1995. But there's also a, an, a, an element, and I didn't think about it as much until this book, of, of spirituality in your books, in, mm. in the sense that, um, like in this case, the book depicts how what people might act like if, if they think it's the end of the world. Mm. And, and it almost seems biblical. And I, I know that your mother can, come from a, came from a long line of preachers. Do, do questions of good and evil, retribution and redemption, run deep in your bloodline, do you think? I, I think they do, and I mean, also I come from the visual art world where high culture and low culture all mixes together with sort of fluidity and ease, unlike I think the written world where everything's quite, you know, here's a list of what's allowed, here's a, lo- a list of what's not allowed. And I think in the art world, you get the sacred and the profane always sort of, gonna, usually if, you, if there's something sacred in the room, there's going to be something profane nearby. And I do think that I mean, I, in other books I've done, like Life After God and Hey Nostradamus, I've gone explicitly after the, the sacred. And then in this case, it's like, well, here, wham, here's the profane. And I think there is a sort of, um, in Raymond's attitude, I mean, I think he would never admit it ever, but like, God, the world has to be better than this. I mean, and like, what on earth are we doing? And like, uh, and there's a part of me like, oh, if he could only like 
harness that, you become a great politician and, and change things. Of course, that's not going to happen. And um, and I, I think that certainly, you know, if you look at the way he behaves, you know, maybe he's fed up with his politics as, you know, you are or I am. I mean, what's happened with this new technology is we have no middle anymore. We've got these, uh, what did Angela Merkel call it? It's a cyclical stagnation. Mm. No, that's what the Chinese said about the Americans when they started, you know, questioning uh, their system. It's this sort of the stagnation and uh, stalemate situation. But that sounds yeah. like, you know what that sounds like? What? Generation X. Oh, God, you know. Sort of does, doesn't it? By the, by, the, <clears throat> by the way, there is a Time magazine cover on Generation Y. <clears throat> Who are these useless little twits and what do they want? God, they're just hopeless. Which is like the exact same cover they used <laughs> exactly 20 years ago for Generation X. I'm sure if you went 20 years before that, it was like these hippies. By the way, have your parents read this foul mouth book? Oh, God. Okay. The parent question. I haven't given them one. And, but, you know, the internet has... They have made, their means, I would assume. The, the internet has made them inquisitive. <laughs> and I don't know, kind of like, okay... Um, it's like, mom, dad, like, like I made a gift pack for you. Oh, look, it's a flamethrower. <laughs> and like, oh, it's some like Jim Daniels and or Jack Daniels. And oh, it's a copy of the new book. Ha, ha, ha. And, uh, uh, I don't want them to read it. Well, they, they, I want them to read it with an open mind. What do you think will happen when they read it? Like, like <gasps> Oh my! I, mean, I think what happens is they might take it literally, and that uh, you do know that, like I think, a vast percentage of the human population is literally not wired neurologically to, to to get the irony. That which is to say, that, you know, well more than half of humanity takes life at face value, which is to me terrifying, and that in order to you know, have mental health, I think you have to be able to hold a lot of uh, conflicting viewpoint, <clears throat> viewpoints in your head at once. And um, and I think, you know, I think my parents, I, I'm underestimating them. My parents always surprise me. Mm. And, but I don't know, I mean, you should have cameras there when we but discuss it, with them. <laughs> it's a reality show about you, you showing your books to your parents. Oh, God. <laughs> But it's interesting. I, mean, I mentioned earlier about how you were being Canadian because you were asking whether you could swear, and then, <laughs> and then even then, after giving, being given permission, you couldn't swear. But, you know, being nice, being polite, getting in line, playing nice, saying sorry. These are the cliche parts of the identity of of, uh, of us as Canadians. We're uh, and how we're seen abroad. And you're something of a de facto ambassador for Canada at this point, both in terms of the motifs uh, in your work and also because you're touring abroad and representing us. Do you think Canadians need to learn to be less nice? Be a little bit more um, like Raymond Gunt? I, uh, this summer I met someone who worked as a politician. He was down in uh, Venezuela. And, and I always ask people, like, what was the thing that surprised you most about being down there? And he said, like, you know what it was? Is that they don't have any word for sorry. What do you mean? Like, so if you bump into someone, you don't say, oh, sorry. Or um, instead you say something along the lines of, well, it sucks to be you. And... And I don't know, I, I, I just find that so, I, I'm, oh God, I'm apologizing for apologizing. I mean, it's just, it's so ingrained in us. Uh, I don't think we should apologize for anything. I think we should be, we're setting an example. I mean, God, of all the countries on earth you could be in, you want to be in here. And there's a reason for that, because we do say sorry and we apologize. And, you know, when we have a scandal, you know, do you think all the scandals that, that like, Berlusconi and the scope and scale and the tawdriness of that scandal. And here it's kind of like someone fakes, an expense, someone expenses fakes, charge. Yeah. Fakes some expenses. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <that's> but, a, <laughs> but there, but there is a question of, of uh, whether there's mendacity there and whether the prime minister is lying or the, or Mike Duffy, et cetera. So, you know, it's a little deeper than that, but yeah, it's a, uh, it, it ain't, Berlusconi, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, since we're ruminating about humanity and human foibles, you're you're terribly successful on so many fronts these days. You're also really prolific. It's a bit annoying, quite frankly, how much you seem to be able to do. Oh dear. Uh, what what is your greatest struggle today, Doug Copeland? Hmm. Um. Actually, before the show tonight, we sort of touched on it. It's clearing out that 
email inbox. I mean, I think this is something we can all relate to. Everyone's got their own philosophy. Some people can't go to sleep at night unless it's empty. That's not me. Um, it's just, uh, I keep about 25 or 30 on, if there's any more than that, I freak out. But some people have hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, what, what irks me is how to deal with these endless, and everyone's got them, requests for something. Could you sign this document? Could you print it out, sign it, and then scan it and send it back to us? Like, that's what really grinds me down. And I'm sort of a perfectionist that way. Like, you know, I can't just have someone else, can you do this? It has to be done by me and it has to be done properly. That's, you know, on a, on a day-to-day level, I think that's one thing that really bugs me. On a larger level... I was going to say, I'm glad there is a large yeah, level, because I was going to say, the, clearing your inbox of email, if that's your greatest struggle, you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I mean, the, the larger struggle is, okay, am I looking at the society we live in? Am I being honest in the way I'm reporting about it in my own way, whether it's visually or verbally? Um, is there something, I'm always looking for things that are so, so incredibly present that they become invisible. And am I, am I looking, am I looking at the right things and... Uh, you know, art takes place in space and words take place in time. And so and as, as living organisms in this universe, that's all we have is time and space, really, and, and free will. Uh, am I using it properly? And, um, and I don't know, I mean, in, in 30 years, I'm probably going to be a pile of dust. So you think the entire size and scope of the universe, and yet, like, we get to be this thing called alive. It's just so amazing. And 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 how many molecules on the earth get to be alive? It, we do. It's like, what is the point of all this? And where is it? Why are we here? Like, ah, and you're so like, why are we here? Mm-hmm. Boom. Is it like? Uh, That's a pretty great struggle. Yeah. Can I just, I mean, not to be macabre about this, but 30 years, if I do my math correctly, you'll only be 81. You expect oh. to be dust then? I always figured it was around... 72 when i was in like in kindergarten grade one like the life expectancy was 72 so in my head it's 2037 it's always been my checkout date one thing i okay this is kind of like gossipy but uh michael jackson was told by a psychic uh that he was going to die when he was 48 and he really 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 believed it and that when he didn't die when he turned 49 he, that's when he sort of became sort of the spaced out creature because he just couldn't believe that he was alive and and there was an unreality to things for him. And for me, I just, you know, it was Mrs. Jafaris kindergarten. <laughs> well, the average life expectancy in North America is 72. And so, of course, everyone in the class is like... It takes out the, that's how they got an us abacus. To, <laughs> that's how they got us to learn subtraction and that. <laughs> Adding, is but like, but that, the uh, life expectancy has changed, Douglas. So it's it's older now. Oh, but okay. and that's the average. You can live to easily till you're a hundred. Oh God, yes, but I don't know if you remember Freedom Fifty Five. Yeah, like, like the ads and stuff. You can have it all. You can work. You can retire at fifty five. Well, you know, pie in the face on that one. I mean, <laughs> who retires? But also, you know, we're working to the grave. Every day of the week is going to be a Thursday you know, for the rest of our lives. And that's fine because, you know, what are you going to do, buy a boat? And like, I want a boat. You know, retirement's sort of stupid too. Um, uh, uh, I want a boat. Yeah, like, oh, I'm not working anymore. I'm in a boat. Well, that's great. (laughs) Think about it. It's pointless. Well, I mean, some sun and perhaps, uh, I don't know how to do it, but it sounds like it would be lovely, actually. Like, like you can wear a cravat and have a martini. <laughs> yes, and, yes. You, know, you it, wake up late, you go up to the top deck, I no, don't know. Bo- boats are bad news. Sooner or later, someone falls off and drowns, and it's just, boats wow. are for losers. Well, um, before I let you go, coming back to your book, uh, Worst Person Ever, um, what do you do to make sure, I mean, we've established that you are not the, the, this book and it's not about you, but what do you do to make sure that you don't become your worst self? Oh, hmm. Um, this is, okay, God, talk about Canadian. And then this is actually the first thing that comes to mind. And um, if someone gives you a present, or does something nice for you, or has you over to the house for dinner. Um, it's like, I should send them a thank you card or thank you note. 
And in the old days, it would have been, I'll do it later. And now it's like, you know, if you have an impulse to kindness, act on it. Uh, because there's not that much kindness in the world. I mean, I think there's more here than other places, but if you have something that could be kind for someone else, I would say do it. Uh, you know, um, cause it might be that simple actually. Uh, that's how I keep myself from, that's how I protect myself from myself. There's that Jenny Holzerism, protect me from the things that I desire. And, you know, the corollary of that is really, you know, please protect me from myself. I'm, you, you know, I'm not my own worst enemy, but I, I can be very clueless sometimes. Great to have you here. Well, thanks, Jan. Always. Okay. Pleasure. Douglas Copeland, writer, artist. His new novel is Worst Person Ever. Doug Copeland has been with me here live in Studio Q.